same chapter. I think it would do, be a great blessing for you to read along with me, at least with the text. Now, after that, I don't care whether you keep up with me or not. I'd rather have your attention, but if you can be attentive and have a scripture scramble, that'll be fine too. But uh, if you can't, I'd rather have your attention. And the message today is entitled, Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. John Milton wrote a literary essay on this particular subject. He also wrote, wrote Paradise Regained back in the 1600s. He lived from 1608 to 1674. His brief literary career as one of the geniuses in the literary circles of England in his day, just after Shakespeare's time by a few years. He wrote a classic entitled Paradise Lost. That was men going to hell. That was the results of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then how to regain it in the other classic entitled Paradise Regained. I am not a plagiarist. I am not stealing his works. I am only taking the title. <laughs> so that's not plagiarism. I've taken that from many people like Winston Churchill. I read his five uh, great volumes on the gathering storm. It's wonderful. It starts off with the rise of the storm and it ends up with their finest hour. Praise God. In the middle of storm breaks. It's almost like Beethoven's five movements in his pastoral symphony. Just in print rather than in music. I copied Winston Churchill and took that title, The Gathering Storm, for a series of messages I've written on prophecy on the rise of the spiritual darkness and the storm of violence and moral corruption that is rising upon the world and including this blessed old land of ours, America. Now we're living in a troubled paradise. There's trouble in paradise, ladies and gentlemen. And there's something about to happen in America that philosophers and politicians and college professors and even preachers cannot explain nor do they understand what's about to happen and what is happening here in this end time generation. And men and governments and the best that we can see great organizations try to do to control the mighty magnetisms of ideologies that are sweeping men and nations into this confusion, into hostility one toward another and blindness so that neither the cause nor the effect can be clearly seen. We're seeing a confusion that we never thought possible in the world as Jesus said and foretold it prophetically in the Sermon on the Mount which is the greatest message on prophecy the world has ever received from the lips of any prophet and he was a true prophet of God, Jesus Christ. That's why he was hated. You never seen a prophet in the ever God ever sent to any generation that was not a despised and ostracized man. Jesus himself being a prophet made this statement in Luke 21 in verse 25. He said there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after the things that are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And this happens before the coming of Christ because the next verse says, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with great power. And when you see these things, then look up. When you see these things come to pass, look up and lift up your head for your redemption. It's not there. It's just still drawing nigh. But all of these cataclysmic events that Jesus foretold, the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New, that concur and corroborate fully with the scriptures prophetically of Jesus Christ's utterances, when he said the sea and the waves would be roaring, he was talking about men being in violent revolution, riots, commotions, and disorders that would absolutely become uncontrollable by the governments of this world. He also said there would be distress of nations with perplexity. That means there would be pressures on the statesmen, the world leaders, and all the well-meaning men of goodwill in this end time generation that they would be pressed from every side with strain and stress of world global conditions of violence and famine and outbreaks of epidemics as Christ calls them pestilence and natural disasters such as happened here just three weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago up in South Carolina and in the islands of the sea. Hugo 
came through. There's going to be more Hugos, and they're going to be huge Hugos. And those things are part of that distress that will cause the distress of nations, that will bring pressures and problems and necessities from every side, and there will be, as Christ said, no solution to these problems. No known solutions can be found to deal with these catastrophic calamities that are coming upon the nations of the world through terrorism, through famine, through epidemics that are incurable, and through the natural disasters of earthquakes and floods and droughts and all types of natural things that will occur. It's really not natural. It is divine judgments. But we call them natural disasters for the sake of natural-minded people who don't understand what these things really are consistent of and who is the author of them. God is sending these things. You can blame it on God. He's a good one to put the blame on, and he's got big, strong shoulders and a square chin, and he can take it. So blame God for it. what he says. I'm going to do this. I'll do this. All right, Jeremiah 8, 13. I want you to notice this very carefully. I'll come back here in just a minute to this 18th chapter of Jeremiah. I want you to go with me briefly to the 8th chapter and verse 13 first. Verse 13, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Did you hear that? God said, I'm going to take back those good things that I've given them. All that affluence, I'm going to take it back. Why is he going to do that? Beginning verse 5, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slid back by a perpetual backslide? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. They won't come back to God. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? What do I need to repent? That's where the church is today. And it's lay out of sin. Revelation 3, 14. God, through Jesus Christ, Jesus was the one that received this revelation from the Lord, from his Father. And he said, I have somewhat against thee because you're lukewarm and you're neither cold nor hot. Because you sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but you know not that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire and white raiment that your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye scab, salve that you may see. The church today is lay out of sin. And the Lord says, they won't repent. All they say is when the prophet says, church, repent to return to divine favor. And they look back at you with a old dumb look like a framer bull out here in a, a white field. Say, what have we done? I like to ask them, what is it you haven't done? Everyone, he says, turns to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. Their ways are not God's ways, and their thoughts aren't God's thoughts. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. The turtle, the crane, and the swallow observe the times of their coming. But my people know not the judgments of the Lord. And that's something God's people, own people, the Christians, the so-called people of God, are the ones that don't even know what God's doing. All they talk about, we're going to fly off and go off to a rapture, to a marriage supper, and head off. They ain't going nowhere. Amen. This church ain't worthy to even get an inch off the ground. Amen. And they're not going to get off the ground. And he says, verse 8, how do you say we're wise in the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. God's men wrote in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They're dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in it? What wisdom is in somebody when they reject the word of God? None. Therefore I give their wives and others in their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. That's what's wrong with the church. It's in a mess. They heal the herd of the daughter of my people slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. No, that's the way the church is today. Therefore, they'll fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, 
They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Now back to Jeremiah 18, verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy? If that nation against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Paradise lost. There's no use to get on that next subject, paradise regained. That's going to come a long time from now. The first thing, America and the Western world and the affluent nations of the Western world are going to give up their affluence because God's going to take it away from them. God's going to create the conditions. Oh, well, men does it. But you know, the Bible said in Proverbs 16 and 4, God hath made all things for himself, even the wicked, for the day of evil. God's made all things for himself. He's even made these evil men out here to obey him when he needs these calamities brought about. He uses those men. And they bring it about. But it's God that's back there like a puppeteer pulling the strings. And men respond, react to God's pulling of those strings on their hearts. Yes, they do. And God said, when a nation won't listen to me anymore, I'll turn away, repent. I'll change my mind toward them. And I won't do them good anymore. Praise God for that. And that's a real revelation. Now the 12th chapter, there's another Jeremiah 12, 17, if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Has America, is America obeying God? Obeying God. The church is not even obeying God. Then we go around wanting to know if people are obeying God. Did you know Americans are one-sixth of this world's population? One-sixth. Big deal. And you know what? Americans eat up 50% of the world's goods. We use it up. We're only 6%. We eat up 50% of the world's food. 6% of the people. No wonder we got so many heavyweights. All these buffets. <laughs> Lord, God damn mercy. Gobble it up. Did you know two-thirds of the world goes to bed hungry or starving to death every night? And you think God's going to let these old, fat, sassy, arrogant Americans prosper and let the rest of the world go to the devil and starve to death right outside of our doors? Well, you say, well, we're, the Americans are willing to share, but you can't get it to them. I don't know whether the average American is willing to share or not. I know there's some Americans that will share. But in this nation of ours, I want to show you the profile of this nation. And ladies and gentlemen, of what value is a sophisticated maze of concrete and steel jungles, skyscrapers, and high-rise luxury penthouses while there's violence and terror and hunger and pestilence and sorrow just raging all about us. What good is it going to do us when God says, I'm going to punish you for your sins? Leviticus 26 verse 18 says, God said, if you will not for all of my judgments hearken unto me, I'll punish you seven more times for your sins. One, I'll break the pride of your power. Two, I'll make your heaven as iron. Three, I'll make your earth as brass. And fourth, your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield or increase, neither shall the trees of the field yield their fruits. Dust bowls and floods are going to devastate this land. Why shouldn't God? This land is full of immorality, homosexuality, bloody abortions abound everywhere. That's got to be the national pastime of debate is over abortions. It's a stinking abomination in the sight of God. Stinking devilish women, old cutthroat doctors and perverted mothers and out here. Oh, now, women, now. I wouldn't 
care if earth wrote about and swallow them up. To tell you the truth, I want this chronicle, and it is. Sorry, rascals, ruining this country. Abortion, unisex styles. Look at one of them. Nudity, crime, violence, murder, theft, cursing, smoking, drinking, dope addiction, gambling, divorce, living like addicts without any uh, rights of matrimony, without being married in the sight of God. Juvenile delinquency, political corruption, false prophets everywhere, phony Christians abound, dead churches, sorry parents, disease, misery, heartache, and rebellion against God's word epitomizes this paradise we live in. God's going to destroy this paradise. Amen. It's going to be lost, and you and I are going to suffer with it. You say, is God going to desert us? No, we're going to have to stick to God. That's the trouble with the ship now. People's abandoned the ship. we got to stay on the ship. The sharks are in the water. There's, the water around us are infested with destruction. Sharks and icebergs to sink the ships of those that think they can sail without God aboard. This paradise is in deep trouble with God. We're not just in trouble with our debtors or creditors. We're not just in trouble with the communists. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Communism has failed. But they've taken on another masquerade. They've put on a new face. They've got a new label on that bottle of death and destruction. And instead they called it communism, which didn't work. Now they've changed to a socialistic, materialistic, old devilish type of philosophy. And it's called humanism. I'm not going to get much on that. I don't have time. But I want to tell you one thing. Humanism has taken over the school system. The educational system of America has already been taken. Now, it hasn't. It's not that it's going to be taken. It's too late to cry over spilled milk. It's already taken. The judiciary system, the judges, the local courts, the state courts, the federal courts has been swallowed up by humanists. And I'm going to tell you another thing. About half of these humanists are lesbians and homosexuals. Yes, they are. And we really have got something on our hands. A deadly reproachment with a devil that's put these thinking perverts right up here to rule over us. You go to court, you ain't going to get no nice guy. You're going to get the sorriest guy in the country. A humanist. They don't believe in the Bible that you believe. They don't, they hate the church you belong to. They despise Christians and preachers that will live right. And they want to put Jim Baker in jail to make an example for other preachers to tremble in their shoes. I don't think he did the right thing, but I wish they hadn't convicted him. Because it's going to be a blow to religious freedom. If they get Jim Baker, they're going to get a lot of other bakers and butchers and candlestick makers and put them in jail too. That's the start. I know they ought to be, but the thing about it is, this is a democracy, and we're supposed to have religious freedom. And the thing about it is, if the, the government ought to stop him or somebody a long time ago. I mean, why'd they let him go that far? Lord, sakes in this world. As the prophet said in Hosea 13 and 9, Oh, Israel, let me inject America. Oh, America. Thou hast destroyed thyself, God said, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? You're destroying yourself with these abominations. That's in Hosea 13. Now you go to Hosea the fourth chapter, and you really find something bad wrong with our nation, and in this case it was Israel. Let me tell you, Israel is just an example that God uses to epitomize the downfall and the judgments that America is going to become victimized by. We're going to be the victims of God's judgment. It's not going to be the communist. Communism has spawned a new religion, and the Supreme Court branded humanism a religion. Communism spawned humanism. And they say they're not violent. They're not Marxist like the communists are, or Leninists. Or Stalinist. 
They're supposed to be pacifists. But the thing about it is, they've got the judiciary on their side, and this nation has evolved into a judicial system that is dangerous, more dangerous than almost communist Russia, because over here, they have begun to code our uh, laws and put the jurisprudence in a different light than what the constitutional fathers meant it to be when an American, if you desire, you could have trial by jury. They have circumvented it. They're making these laws now to put Christians in jail and call it civil disobedience. And no jury. You can't have a jury. You get a humanist judge. And he determines your fate. It's wicked. God have mercy sakes. That Constitution, our fathers of this republic made that evident that we were to have the freedom of having a jury if we wasn't uh, really, if we didn't think we got a fair deal with that guy sitting on that bench. But now you can't do it. They done changed the laws on us. And even the Constitution has been reinterpreted by these perverts that it don't mean what our founding fathers meant for it to mean. Lord, have mercy sakes. And out of this humanism, there's a paganism, there's a moral depravity, there's a perversion spiced together with an arrogant rejection of getting specific about God and his commandments and judgments and his judgment for sin and all of these commandments of God that tells us what sin really is. We've seen rebellion against the word of God that has resulted in the desecration of this virtual paradise that we call America, that was founded under the motto, in God we trust. Our trust is in materialism and pleasure, and pleasure is a God of America, not the God of the Bible. God help us. Every promise of God to the individual, the human family, or the nation is always conditional and is premised upon obedience. That's a dirty word in the pulpits of America today. These Calvinists, these once in grace eternal security guys have absolutely permeated. They've saturated and polluted the whole spiritual uh, element in America today until the churches, the seminaries, all the literature you read, every uh, TV program and, and uh, radio program is absolutely polluted with this stinking Calvinism and this old sin everyday religion. Sakes. We're living in a fool's paradise as a result. God's judgments are not going to be restrained just because preachers think they can hold them back with their old long prayers and their scissor tailed coats and their little goatees and their little patronizing tones of old God. We ain't got nothing but bunch of hypocrites. Stinking mess. And the thing about it is, what are you hauling and squalling about? I don't like what they're doing to this country is the reason and done to the church. I don't like it. And I got a big mouth. And I thank God I got a few supporters that I can get on radio. We just got them a brand new station. Starts Monday night. It's the biggest station in the whole U.S. for the outreach it makes. We finally got there. It touches and do it. It comes out of Lexington, Nebraska. It reaches everything across the boundary that goes straight from the Gulf up to Canada, from this side of Nebraska and Iowa, and it reaches all from there. As I say, the, the border is from the Gulf clear up into Canada. It reaches everything west of there clear out into the Pacific. I think it's 120 dollars a night. So we got to start raising a little bit more money. We got to warn people they're going to lose their paradise. They're going to lose their paradise. And they've got to know God is angry and God's the one that's going to take back what he gave us. He gave us what we've got. See, these stupid Americans think science gave it to us. Just because you got these high rises, you got faster planes and longer bridges and better vitamins and greater drugs to shoot yourself with and cure you some old disease. Let me tell you something. With all their innovations, with all their breakthroughs, 
in the scientific discoveries that have lengthened the life of man's expectancy here in this paradise we're living in. Man has rebelled against the creator that gave us these wonderful things. Yeah. He gave us the chickens and the copper bottom box pots to fry them in. He, he, them was his cows, and he gave us the broiler to cook them all. Them chickens and fowls and cows and all them fish in the sea. Listen to this. God says he's going to take them back. Hosea 4, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. I want you to remind, I want to remind you something. Israel is just a type of the church of our day. Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. It's our example. Israel is our example. Read 1 Corinthians 10. All these things, verse 6, happen unto them for examples. Verse 11. Now all these things were at our examples that we should not lust after evil things. What happened back here is our examples. Romans 15 and 4. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 2 Peter 3 and 1. He bases it again that all these things that were written in the prophets were written for our examples. And then we get people, oh, don't like the Old Testament. They're going to learn to like it because these pestilences and foresword judgments of God's going to come on this nation and these western nations with a magnitude unprecedented. So he says, why? Why has God got a controversy with the land? Because the, there's no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. And by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. What's the bloodiest crime in this nation? Abortions. Since that old law, Roe and Wade, was passed by the Supreme Court in 73, wasn't it? There's been enough people killed, little babies, that would more than the population of Minnesota and Iowa and Nebraska and North Dakota and South Dakota and Montana and Nevada and Utah and Idaho all put together. In other words, if they would have had euthanasia, they would have wiped out the population of that many states in this yeah. United States. Sorry, rascals. Right. God, have mercy sakes. Therefore the land will mourn, verse 3 says, everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish. God's going to take this paradise away. Like he did Adam and Eve. He drove them out and destroyed that paradise. There's no rim. There's no trace of it. He said, everyone that dwelleth there shall languish. You know what languish means? It means to dry up and wither. That's that's language that is unique in the prophetic scriptures of a few of the prophets of the Old Testament. That's not in the new, that's in the old. That spatial, unique language that the prophets are trying to get a whole cross to us. God ain't going to come down here like Sodom and Gomorrah and just wipe us out. He's not going to send a flood and drown us like he did in Noah's day. We're going to languish. That means gradually wither and dry up like a plum turns into a prune. We're going to look like prunes before it's over with. You look, read old Joel 1 and 2. Boy, he talks about languishing. Figs on the fig tree. All the beasts of the field will languish. That means they'll dry up and wither and die and fall over out in the pasture where there's no grass, where the drought is destroyed. The birds will be falling victim to starvation and pestilence. Language. All right? This is what he says. The land will mourn. Everyone that dwells therein shall languish with the beast of the field, with the fowls of the heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. You're not going to have no seafood platters. No 
fried chicken. The old Colonel had to close up. Steakhouses will be out of business. Cattle will be dying, falling out here. Their carcasses laid out in the open for the vultures. You know the only thing that's gonna, gonna fare good, according to the scriptures, Ezekiel 38 and 39, is the vultures. They're gonna be fat and flourishing and multiply. God's gonna multiply the vultures. The kind you can't eat. They just eat up what we should eat that dies and languishes. God's gonna take this paradise away. He ain't going to drive us out like he did Adam and Eve. He's going to languish. We're going to languish and wither with it and still be in it. And see the destruction of it through drought, pestilence, natural disasters, hunger, starvation. Yes, God's going to take it away. You know why? Verse 6, Hosea 4. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because you rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. And he goes on and said, you forgot the law of your God, I'll forget your children. Verse 7, as they were increased, they sinned against me. See, when God blessed the people in America, they become fat and arrogant, gluttonous. They become revelers, lovers of pleasures, Paul the Apostle said, more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. See, people always, they always invent a religion to suit their lifestyle. That's the devil's delight. Turn the churches into a religious formality. Be carnal and say you're in the spirit. Sin and say everybody sins. God have mercy sins. I don't care what the old liars say. You don't have to sin every day. Amen. All right, verse. <laughs> As they were increased, a Sin against me. I'll turn their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people like the preacher, the priest. And I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. They'll eat and not have enough. They'll commit whoredom and not increase because they've left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. That's what God's people are guilty of. Verse 12. My people ask counsel at their stops and their staff declareth unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err and they've gone a whoring out from under their God. Jesus sakes. He can go on. That's a nasty mess there. I don't have time for all of that. But I want to tell you ladies and gentlemen our prayers and plans are soon going to be turned into dust bowls followed closely by severe food shortages and hunger with many untimely deaths of people, livestock, fish, fowls, yes, languish. There's going to be in some areas rain and other areas won't get a drop. It'll be flooded in one place and it'll be dry as a bone in another place. People running to and fro and there's going to be government regulations. There's going to be curfews. It's going to block these set fat, sassy Americans from flying yonder and traveling over there, moving from one place to another and going to and fro. There's going to be martial laws and God's going to settle people down. And his, his judgments, he can deal with them through true men of God that he's prepared for these coming judgments that are going to be in a magnitude unprecedented. God speak of these through Jesus Christ, his prophet, he said in Matthew 24 and 8, as he had mentioned, pestilences, earthquakes, famines, terrorism, with religious deception and persecution of God's saints, he says, all of these are the beginning. These are only the beginning of sorrows. It's not the end. The beginning. God, have mercy saints. Woo! This nation of ours, all these good things. How many of you, when you go to a restaurant, you look around and see how many folks bow their heads and give God a twid at least a twiddly dink? Thanks before they eat. They, they, you could say half a dozen a week turn thanks and say, God, I thank you for that cow that died for me. I thank you for that fish that was caught to keep me from starving. I thank you for that chicken that died for me. I thank you for that waitress that brought it to me, that cook that cooked it. 
thank you, Lord, for it. Amen. Praise God. But no, next time you go, you notice how many diners around you offer any thanks to God before they surf it. God going around, it can't even hardly get up to the buffet, you know, stand up there or rear in about that big or stumbles about that big, here they're down there in the soup and the gravy or running over the bowl and the oh, foot. What a nasty mess! Don't you like to go there and play in it after they played in it? Yeah. Don't be ashamed of ourselves every time we go to a buffet. Take an oath to God and say, I'll never come back to another one of these things. Lord, have mercy sakes. Only fools, ladies and gentlemen, can believe God will not severely judge this arrogant society and haughty church of this fool's paradise that we are members of. He has to be a plain fool to not believe that God is going to judge severely this generation that we're living in. Well, don't you just blame the pervert, the fornicator, and the scoundrel, my dear friend. Don't you just blame them rascals. And don't shrug off this indictment of God's great judgments upon this end time generation by saying this Old Testament stuff. Them apostles of Christ and Jesus himself spoke very, very definitely about an end time generation that we would suffer exactly what the prophet said would come upon us. Old Paul the apostles preaching over there in the city of Asia Minor in Acts the 13th chapter verses 40 and 41. He said, take heed lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. And he prophesied out of Habakkuk. Chapter 1. You ought to read it. That's a terrible prophecy. And he said, you better take heed and that'll come on you. What that prophet said over in Habakkuk. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I do a work in your day which you will in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You ain't going to believe it. Yeah. It's still that way. Don't want it? God would send angels down here to preach it. They wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't accept it. Jesus, saints in this world. Listen to what God said here in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, about those people come out of Egypt and why he, why he had to destroy Israel and the church of old. Ezekiel 20, verse 6. God said to Ezekiel, In the day I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I spied for them, a paradise, may I say, flowing with milk and honey. Don't that sound like a paradise? Woo! Which is the glory of all lands. I said unto them, cast you away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I'm the Lord talking to you. Think just a prophet. But they rebelled against me. They would not hearken unto me. They did not cast away every man the abomination of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And I said, I'll pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger upon them or against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen. See, God told them to clean up their act. Don't you bring them idols of Egypt. Don't you bring them old earrings, them nose jewels and ankle rings and those old beads and pearls and junk they hung on their body today the churches are so full of this mess of the idols of Egypt you can make a golden calf in almost every church you go to God said don't wear it and the preachers say oh God looks at the heart hey before you begin to judge the perverts and the fornicators and the gamblers and the dope addicts Let's get down to who's responsible for this mess of paradise lost. You know why we're going to get kicked out of paradise? Or we're going to languish and dry up and our paradise is going to be taken? It's preachers. Preach. Perfidious preachers. Oh, they look sweet. They look gentle. Their looks deceiving. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, says, Such that preach another Jesus, preach another gospel, and have another spirit, they're false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the ministers of Christ, and no marvel, 
For Satan's ministers are also transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. What they preach. They're leading people back to Egypt like old Nathan did in the church of Moses. Come on, you don't have to live like them holy rollers. I wish we had a few holy rollers. That's a dying breed. I don't think there's two or three left, and I ain't sure where they are. You used to have that name. You could almost justify it. Holy Rose. Get up and seeking God in the altar, somebody get happy. Lord, they get out and they didn't know what to do with all that wonderful joy and ecstasy that came into their heart and soul. They'd been an old gambler, a prostitute, or a uh, God hater, and thief, and rogue, and fornicator, and everything else. He got. Or she got saved. They didn't know what to do with that wonderful feeling they had. They'd get out and kick and squirm and roll and run. <laughs> I did all that. <laughs> I kind of got over it because now I just stayed full of joy about all the time. But that newfound joy. Whoa, something else. Let's get let's put the trouble where it is. Let's put the trouble where it is. In this paradise of ours. It's filled with teenagers and young adults by the tens of thousands that are literal savages. Yeah. Our paradise is full of scallywags and bums and teenagers that are savages. Yeah. You hear what I say? Better listen to it. That's what's the scourge of this society. Woo -bee. What does it result from? Jesus Christ, our great prophet of history, he foretold of an end time unspeakable tragedy resulting from this widespread rejection of Bible morals and discipline that has affected the parents and spread like an epidemic to the youth of this nation and the nations around us. Yeah. They're like a bunch of wild boys and girls. They're like animals. They don't even act like human beings. Human beings settle down and behave themselves. These animals just run like something crazy. And here's one of the predictions Jesus said would happen in our end time because of these wild boys and girls. Listen to this, Mark 13, 12. That's one of the Olivet messages that Mark wrote. Luke wrote one in Luke 21, and Matthew wrote one in Matthew 24. It's all the same message. Just some had revelations that the other one did not have. Now listen to this. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause him to be put to death. I didn't say parents rise up against the children. It said children would rise up against their parents and cause them to be executed. God, hell, what's it say? Is the church and Christians going to be subjected to such indignities, indignities and harassment as Jesus writes about? Yeah, they're going to be here. These little cool cookies that call themselves preachers and pastors and apostles and evangelists and all, they're the ones God's going to get. He's got their number. They don't like me because i got their number too. Like that old boy at that valley made a phone call. He got God on the phone. You know, that was the way it's supposed to be. And in the conversation, you don't hear God, you just hear that old boy. He said, uh, 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 who's this I got? He said, this, this is the Lord? He said, yeah, evidently. He says, uh, well, what was it you said, Lord? Where was I Sunday? He says, well, well, well Lord, I, I got a new boat and I had to go try it. He said, where are you going? You ain't going to need it. What was it you said, Lord? Where I'm going? I don't need no boat. Yeah. Then he asked him what he did with his money. He said, oh, oh, oh well, Lord, you know that I, I had to pay for that boat and I had a lot of other things going, this and that and the other. But he answered back. Then when he got to the end, his wife said, Honey, did you get the wrong number? He says, No, honey. I believe he's got my number. <laughs> These jokers in the pulpit, God's got their number. God's got their number. Jeremiah 14, God said, Them's the first people God's going to get are the preachers. He said, They say yeah, the church ain't going to have no famine or pestilence or terrorism. But as I live, saith God, I'll destroy these preachers with famine and pestilence and terrorism. Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Lord, I agree with you. Yes. Praise God. I like this. These sorry preachers don't like you. I can't help it. I can't help if you don't like it. 
I don't like what they're doing in our country either. I realize why God's sending these judgments, these four terrible judgments, and are going to destroy our paradise is because of sorry preachers. It's not the fellow in the pool bed. All right, let me show you that. My God, that's one of the greatest things in the Bible here. In the book of Jeremiah, let's go to it real quickly here before I run out of time. In Jeremiah, the 19th chapter first. Jeremiah 19 and verse 4, God said, because they have forsaken me. Who's the Bible written to? It's written to God's people. This is written to the church of old. Because they have forsaken me, they have estranged this place and burned incense to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and listen to this, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. Where in the name of God do you get innocence? You get them out of the mother's womb. They ain't no more innocence. He's talking about abortions. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Abortions are not a new fad. The devil's just brought it about here in this modern age with new people and new names and a new crisis. They've had it. It's been a, a stinking devil's innovation from old. The church in old had it. And listen to what God said I'll do about it. Verse 8, I'll make this city desolate. I'll make it a hissing. Everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and his fright because of all the plagues are off. God said I'm going to send plagues on you abortionists. Doctors, gals, mamas, N-O-W, E-R-A, the sorry women, and preachers are ruining this country, along with these hoodlum teenagers. All right? Go to Ezekiel, the 14th chapter. This is really the epitomization of what's wrong with us. Verse 12, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me, he wasn't talking about just Israel. He's talking about anybody's land, any country, any nation, like Jeremiah did in Jeremiah 18, when that nation will not hearken to my voice any longer, I'll destroy it and pluck up that nation. All right. He said, when that land sinneth against me by trespassing, trespassing grievously. That's not normal sins. Everybody's born a sinner. God's not talking about normal sins. He's talking about Intemperate, excessive sinning, grievously, going far beyond all realms of ordinary sin and becoming depraved. Depravity, ladies and gentlemen, makes a person act like an animal. Yeah. Americans are not just sinners, they're depraved. And he says, I'll stretch my hand and break the staff of bread and bring famine upon you. All right? Listen to verse 17. If I bring a sword upon that land, then say Israel, it said that land. It means America in the land. I say sword, that's terrorism. You go through the land and cut off man and beast. Verse 19. If I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. If Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could not save their sons or daughters, but deliver their own souls. In verse 21, thus saith the Lord God, now, if he says, I do that to any land, he says, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine, that's terrorism, and famine, the noise of beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. In the New Testament, there's a new one revealed, and that is natural disasters with earthquakes being the main element of God's judgment. Now, listen, there's a... There's, Something wonderful comes out of this. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth both sons and daughters. See, out of this terrible judgment of God, a magnitude unprecedented upon a society that is grievously sick and perverted like it was in the days of Noah. We're like Noah's day. Genesis 6 and 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great and upon the earth, and every thought of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 11, Genesis 6. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Yeah. And it's going to be a violent time in just a few more months when God begins to pour out.
with great magnitude these four sword judgments that are designed to bring people on their knees into repentance. See, out of all these judgments, there's going to come forth sons and daughters, young people, that are going to repent and be brought forth to you. And you'll see their ways and doings. You'll be comforted concerning the evil that I brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they'll comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you'll know that I have not done without cause all that I've done in it, saith the Lord God. God has a love element in this, bringing men to repentance. If it takes these terrible judgments, bring it, Lord, to make men repent. You remember Romans 2 and 4 said, it's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. It's the goodness of God. You ever seen somebody dying with a cancer? And they pat that thing and say, I have. Brother Pringle, if God hadn't put that cancer on me, I'd have been lost and gone to hell. This chasing me back to the Lord. That's a wonderful testimony. It's not all that bad. It's bad to sit there and hold a man down to go to hell. Let him die to go to hell. What does the Bible say about the saints? Praise is in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We got this old humanism even in the church today. Oh, uh, let's comfort him. Let's give him his last request. Let's shoot him with some kind of old drug so he won't hurt. Won't hurt. You want him to hurt. Praise God so he get things right with God. Don't want him to hurt. Slip him in the head. I tell you, this is a stinking mess of a sick, dying society we members of, and God's going to destroy it. God's going to take it back. It ain't going to last. No way. Now, I've got a lot of the scriptures, but I can't get on them all. But I am going to get on this one. That's Isaiah, the 59th chapter. We've got to. It's the longest, and I've just got to use it. So I want you to turn with me Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Verse 3. This is a classic statement. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. There's some more of that abortions, that shedding of innocent blood. Your fingers pulling them fetuses out yeah. with all kind of forceps and suction devices and all kind of things with no anesthesia given to that little unborn baby that has head and feet and form just like you have in a heart and that baby has pain and they yeah. jerk him out of there and tear him to pieces. Stinking devils. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue averted perverseness. None call it for justice nor any pleaded for the truth. That's just like us. They trust in vanity, they speak lies, they conceive mischief, they bring forth iniquity. That's rebellion. Oh, Lord. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Make haste to shed innocent blood. They're out here plotting and planning right now. The legislature, the state supreme court, and everybody else. How we can have more abortions. And our young people can have more flings. They can commit more immorality. They can get out here and catch more AIDS. And our abortion clinics will give them an abortion. The AIDS clinics will treat their AIDS and help them to die with dignity. How do you die with dignity when you're stinking to pray dolly cat? Dig you to your foot. They ought to bury them stinking old Supreme Court justices with them. They'd all catch the eggs and die. Oh, they'd have another bunch just like them in there, though. God, have mercy sakes. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, rebellion. That's all they think about. Wasting and destruction are in their past. The way of peace, they know not. There's no judgment in their goings. They've made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore do judgment. His judgment far from us, neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. Our statesmen, our preachers, our politicians, our agriculturists, our scientists, our military men, they're all groping like blind men. They can't handle Panama. They can't handle Cuba. They can't handle Nicaragua. They can't handle nothing. Right. Now, I'm going to jump on Grenada, the whole country about that big. Anything about anything, they leave it alone. Why? They grope like the blind. 
They stumble at noondays in the night. They're like dead men in desolate places. They roar like bears. They mourn like doves. We look for judgment. There is none for salvation is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee. Our sins testify against us. Our transgressions are with us and us for our iniquities. That's our rebellions. We know them. We know what we rebelled, what against and how and everything about it. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, in departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. Has somebody for them to pick on and to try to persecute. And the Lord saw it. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. God, dear mercy's sakes in this world. Oh, Lord. One scripture in conclusion. Amos 9, beginning in verse 7. Are you not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Aren't you like a bunch of Ethiopians? You're not even like God's people, the people I call you, like a bunch of Ethiopians, saith the Lord. Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? And the Philistines from Captain, the Syrians from Kir, behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, that's Israel, the church too. I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. I'm going to destroy the church, but I'm going to save that holy remnant out of the middle of it. That's in the midst of it. People say they can't tell the difference. I can. Praise God. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like his corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, terrorism, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. That's what the church is saying today. These stinkingly Odyssey Christians, we're going to be gone. They're the very ones that's going to be here. That's right. They ain't going nowhere, except in the tribulation. Listen to that. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. That's terrorism. We say that evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is still parroting the same old perverted philosophies that the church of old has always tries to use to circumvent the judgments of God. They're going square into it, right into the teeth of the judgments of God. And they're going to be chewed up and spit out. God's going to take away all this fanciful stuff, the influence we have. Paradise is going to be irretrievably lost. God said, my people don't even know the judgments of the Lord. The stork in the heaven knoweth their appointed time. The turtle, the cream of the swallow, observe the times of their coming. But my people don't know the judgments of the Lord. Well, you pray and help me to tell them. You support this ministry and help me to raise my voice. Yes, I'll yes. tell them. They right. cut my head from here to high. I'll tell them. Yes, as long as there's breath in this body. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Patrick Henry says, Forbid it, Almighty God! I know not what course you gentlemen may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death! Amen in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our Father, receive this message and may it grip the hearts and gnaw at the hearts and minds and souls of your people all over this nation and hemisphere. I pray in the name of the Lord, you honor it, anoint it, keep your eyes upon it as it goes through the mails, UPS and other ways, to get into the right hands of groups and individuals and families and churches, yes. and especially preachers, and exalt it, magnify it. May it turn many hearts to your righteousness and open their eyes to the understanding of these prophetic scriptures that lay dormant in the Holy Word of God. We ask it in Jesus' name.